Um, so, yes, as Lorna says, um, uh, in addition to being CBA, which is on my badge at this conference, and CIFA, which is on my badge at some other conferences, I'm still attached to the University of York, very happily. Um, and um, this is a chance for me to present a little bit of my uh, PhD research, um, which looked into the political functioning of the historic environment sector. Um, I don't, I'm not an archaeologist, I don't have an archaeology background, I do have an interest in culture and heritage and the past generally, um, and I'm therefore interested in how the, the professional sector functions in its relationship to government. Um, and in this paper I want to describe a framework for a practical and pragmatic uh, professional ethics for the historic environment sector and the bodies within it, um, which I built as part of my, my research. Um, the framework responds to how I observe heritage values and um, heritage politics functioning in the UK in the current era. Um, essentially the point of it is to say that uh, there exists a central ethic for heritage which is um, public value centred. Um, as Florence says, uh, this, um, even when this concepts from the past are used by the likes of UKIP and, and LEAVE, um, they are using it essentially in the same way, in a public value way. They talk about identity and memory and belonging um, and not necessarily just about stuff. Um, now, as a sector, I think we particularly essentially talk about heritage with reference to these public values and that this has become more and more widely accepted, more and more dominant in the past 20 years. Um, however, political support for this type of value system is not assured. Um, current austerity politics and small state governing ideologies are not sympathetic to this. Um, and there is a, 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 a pervasive kind of lack of consideration about the types of diverse public values that people might have, as well as other political narratives that, that, that um, uh, don't sort of have a, um, don't hold this in, in high regard. So the public value framework that I'm going to describe sets out how we can, um, as a sector, operationalise this public value ep ethic, even in a seemingly unsympathetic world. Um, as Kevin said, I don't have the answers particularly, but I will present a couple of um, potential options for strategies that we might be trying to adopt or at least reflect on in, in the positions that we all hold within the sector. Um, and essentially it's going to, to, to revolve around ideas of populist advocacy, public engagement and measurement of what the public think, uh, partnerships within the sector but also beyond the sector with other people who share similar value sets um, and a pragmatic approach. So unlike Florence, I don't want to rip up the book but um, I want to think about how we can pragmatically engage with those people even if they don't obviously agree with us. Okay, so uh, as I say, my belief is that we live in a public value era of heritage politics where what we do and what we say about heritage is defined primarily in terms of people and what people think and care about. Um, this isn't precisely what the public value, um, although that is a factor, um, but more broadly how and why people value things or places and what effects that this heritage has on them in terms of their cares and concerns about the world um, and the benefits that accrue from um, having access to that heritage. Um, so since it's TAG, obligatory theory, um, it's not particularly necessary for you in the 15 minutes that I've got. The way I describe this though is with reference to um, the concept of Heidegger's being in the world. Um, I believe that heritage is essentially a um, psychological connection between people and places and the effects that arise from that. And how that manifests in an individual is that they have cares that arise out of their interaction with the world that surrounds them. Um, and it's therefore a core facet of our being. I think it really is that important to who we are and therefore every aspect of what we do in our lives. Um, we don't really merely exist in our world, we're shaped by it. Um, and our heritage and our existence is interdependent. 
Um, the most important thing for a session about why archaeology is a political matter is that in a shared world, this implies that heritage requires <coughs> discussion because each of us have our own connections to the world, our own heritages, and therefore we require a political mediation amongst ourselves as communities. There you go. You very nearly got a whole session on Heidegger. Um, happily, we didn't get it in before the deadline, so um, count yourself lucky that that's all you've got. <laughs> Um, okay, so my belief is that this way of thinking is, broadly speaking, a dominant narrative um, in heritage today. Um, there are a number of strong historical reasons why we might say this. Um, firstly, if you follow through from um, the, the 1990s, late, late 1980s, we started to, start to, to talk about things like social inclusion, we started to talk about people's individual heritage, everyday values, um, we, we dissociated as a sector from um, ideas of only the biggest and the best and the material nature of heritage. Um, Power of Place, a very influential document from English Heritage in 1990, um, spun that traditional idea of a material heritage which is um, exclusive completely <coughs> on its head. Um, the image on the on the front shows you exactly why um, exactly what it's, that document is all about. Sadly, Historic England have taken it off their website now, uh, which I think is is a real shame. Um, and this played into the new la la the new Labour agenda at the um, um, in the, the the end of the the 1990s and start of the 2000s. Um, and through that period, through the development of those ideas of public heritage value we um, started to get opportunities to put this into policy. So we had a Heritage Protection Bill, which sadly didn't pass in 2008. I may mention that again um, in, a f in a few slides' time. Um, and Planning Policy Statement 5, um, the uh, replacement for PPG 16 and 15, um, which had a very um, b more broad potential to deal with heritage um, using the idea of significance, which can apply to much more than um, previous um, materialistic um, value sets could, and they, as they were defined in previous policy. Um, but this can change over time. So my, I don't, I'm not quite sure that the Venn diagram is the right thing to have here. But it, what it shows is that the public value circle has shrunk since 2008, particularly because of the. Um, uh, economic crash, which changed the value set of government at the time, even the new Labour government, they stopped talking as much about social inclusion, welfare, individual um, cares and concerns, and started talking much more about the economic. And certainly that's uh, been doubled down on in, um, us in the, the, since 2010, when we've had um, Conservative-led government. Um, and so the concept is slightly different. Um, however, I do think that these three elements of heritage value are ever-present and even when we got the very first heritage legislation, public value had a, con um, had a, had a purpose in there. Early social reformers like um, Octavia Hill, who founded the National Trust or was one of the founders, um, had a public value um, core of her belief about why, uh, the, why open spaces and to a lesser extent material heritage was important to people. Um, okay, so definitions from current practice. Uh, I hope that most of you agree broadly with my assertion that, that public value is a dominant narrative today, but two examples to hopefully say that this does exist in, in our policy as well as in our professional thinking. Faro Convention 2005 defines cultural heritage as a group of resources inherited from the past with which people identify independently of ownership as a reflection and expression of their constantly evolving values, beliefs, knowledge, and traditions. Um, it includes all aspects of the environment resulting from the interaction between people and places through time. And even the National Planning Policy Framework, though we had to fight hard for it, um, has a very broad definition of what the historic environment is. All aspects of the environment resulting from the interaction between people and places through time. So we have this built into our, um, our understanding. Um, however, why do we need a public value framework? Um, so I uh, talked about the 1990s and how this public value agenda grew. Um, since that time, we've had a, a, a range of things that have, that have kind of 
um, led to that being very, very much rode back from. And so these are just a few examples. A very deregulatory planning agenda, um, cuts to local government resulting in huge losses to the professional sector, etc., etc. Essentially, public value has a very low political capital. Um, however, I think it's crucial to think that public value narratives have been internalised to some degree by even the Tory government that we've got at the moment, um, and this is um, a really important thing for us as we go forward. So how has the sector responded? Um, essentially and sadly, I think we have um, started to retreat from that public value uh, rhetoric that we had so strongly um, in the 1990s and 2000s, well, particularly 2000s. Um, and this experience is borne out in my interview data through my PhD and um, all the rest of it in the professional meetings that I've been in since, where people say things like, that stuff about public value just doesn't wash with this government, so let's not say it. Let's talk about the economics. Um, and an example of that is the Heritage Counts reports that are produced by um, Historic England um, for the Historic Environment Forum. So they're very much a reflection of what the sector thinks are the most important issues in heritage at any given time. And if you look pre-2009, the topics that were chosen before the crash, um, they are sense of place, climate change, education, they're all public value concepts. Post-2009, you're talking about branding, resilience, value and impact. There's a material one in there which is skills, but the rest are economic. Um, the odd one is big society, um, uh, and then there's an anecdote, it's, it's strange that, um, I mean, ah, interesting, people are laughing at that, um, it wasn't engaged with very well in the sector, and um, the person who runs these reports, who is responsible for producing them, thinks that it failed because the sector didn't buy into the big society, so it's fascinating that I think that people have that reaction, I might talk about it again in questions if I get some time. Um, so this is the public value framework. Um, what does it do? It tells us how we can promote public value ethics even against an unsympathetic public background. So um, essentially it's an authorising environment with the four main groups um, that are involved in, in the sector and in presenting the sector to politicians and policy makers at the top. That's us, professionals in the heritage sector, our peers relate to other sectors, publics at the bottom, and um, it embodies various principles, such as democratic um, principles of public pressure, publics holding accounts, um, holding politicians and policymakers to account, sector advocacy, the way we present our, um, our um, <coughs> arguments to, to politicians and how they authorise us to um, engage in action, either by funding us or changing policy. Um, and then, crucially, the thing I think we do least well at the moment, um, create relevant engagement for the public who in turn provide legitimacy and a support through that democratic accountability um, for us to act and act within our, our, our bounds of public our, of our commitment to public value. Um, okay so what does this mean? It means an, a renewed cycle of ethical engagement for the sector. By adopting a populist strategy we can build a base for understanding and support um, through activism and engagement, we can ensure that influence drawn from popular support, by capturing popular support through appropriate mechanisms, we can build political legitimacy, and by developing relevance, we can increase the heritage offer for people and build professional relations. Thank you. I'm running out of time, so I will go through my last four examples very quickly. As I say, I don't have um, answers, but these are four things that we might want to do more. Um, growing democratic legitimacy, this is vital. We need to culture a demand for heritage with, with um, people. We are traditionally much better at talking to government as a professional sector than we are at talking to people. There are great examples out there, History Matters, Heritage Open Days, Dig It in Scotland at the moment, that sell these stories and culture the demand for heritage. But as a professional sector, we don't do it all the time. We could reflect more about how we could do it better. Um, develop mechanisms to capture public support, support. Very obvious, time's up, so I will just go through the headlines. Um, develop a professional relevance for heritage, or of heritage, I don't know if that's a typo. And finally, a topic we'll come back to um, in, other topic, in other sessions throughout the rest of the day, and in questions, I hope. Um, engage in activism. 
example, forests, um, the forestry um, sell-off in 2011, that's where that picture comes from, the bottom. And as UKIP are using heritage um, to sell their narrative, campaigners and activists like these guys were using heritage to sell their narrative about why the forests were important to people and the government you turned on that. David Cameron is being given a headache by planning for people, National Trust campaign over the MPPF. Um, a fantastic campaign that was based on why planning was important to what we value. It was a public heritage campaign um, and it had a, a huge effect in making the MPPF a document that we would recognise as something that um, appreciates public value rather than completely undermines it, which is what we got in the draft. And out of time, so I'll leave you to uh, soak in my final diagram, um, which I won't go through. Thank you. Thank you.